They're doing what? They're building submerged bridges. Do they still count as bridges if they're underwater? Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. I'm not sure how that would, how they work, but you know, they sound pretty cool, right? Like, submerged bridges, huh? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Huh. November 5th, 1943. The Allies have fought their way up the Solomon Islands since they landed on Guadalcanal in August last year. And this week, this week, they're nearly to the top and land in force on the biggest Solomon Island of them all. I'm Andy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Soviets took Melitopol in the south and Dnipropetrovsk on the lower Dnieper. But by the end of the week, the Germans managed to stop their momentum of the past couple months, having finally been reinforced with a lot of armor. The Allies kept up the pressure on the main Japanese base at Rabaul, sending in bombing runs three straight days, and also made attacks on the Treasury Islands and Choiseul. Those attacks are diversions, though, from the main attack against Bougainville Island, which goes off now on the 1st. 20,000 men of the 1st Amphibious Corps of the U.S. Marines under Alexander Vandegrift sailed the day before. They are outnumbered, but they plan to rely on their Navy and Air Force. The overall strategy is this. The neutralization of Rabaul was predicated on building Allied airfields on Bougainville. These permitted Allied fighters and single-engine bombers to reach Rabaul's airfields. They also saved wear on aircraft. Additionally, whereas flights from New Guinea were often stymied by stationary fronts in the Solomon Sea, these weather patterns were typically well west of the Solomon Islands. Weather offered fewer issues to Bougainville-based aircraft. At 7.30 a.m., the ships begin to land the Marines around Cape Torokina. Within a few hours, they have a solid beachhead. American planes bomb enemy airfields on Buka and Shortland. The Japanese still manage to send up a lot of planes that damage a U.S. destroyer and some transports, but they lose a fair number of their own. Japanese aircraft proved unequal to disrupting the invasion fleet. Several attacks were launched from Rabaul, all involving fewer than 20 bombers. In each, the sole result was the loss of most of the bombers sent, and only minor damage inflicted on shipping in Empress Augusta Bay. Well, one of those attack waves does involve like 100 Japanese planes, but still. The Americans are landing in the lightly held middle of the island near Empress Augusta Bay. The idea is to create and hold a perimeter just large enough to build airfields that are safe from Japanese counterattack. Vandegrift has guessed correctly that enemy forces are concentrated near their Bougainville airfields. So the jungle means it will take them time to get reinforcements to Torokina. 14,000 Americans have been landed by nightfall. The transports leave, and a minefield is laid off the coast to protect the beachhead. The total surprise of the landings is super fortunate for the attackers, because the beach is enfiladed by 18 camouflaged pillboxes, which, had they been fully manned, could have put a full halt to the landings with huge casualties. Thing is... Even successful, the operation could become a huge disaster for the Allies anyhow, because two Japanese heavy and two light cruisers with six destroyers are heading there from Rabaul to counterattack. By midnight, they're well under 100 kilometers away. What stands between them and the beachhead is Chip Merrill's Task Force 39 with four light cruisers and eight destroyers who are guarding the transport standing off the bay. They are sent out to intercept the Japanese warships in the Battle of Empress Augusta Bay. Just past 1.30 a.m., the U.S. cruisers open fire with radar range guns. Over the next couple hours, they savage the Japanese, disabling and then sinking a light cruiser and scattering their formations. As the forward American destroyers release torpedoes, the Japanese fleet is thrown into disarray, with two destroyers even running into each other. One of those eventually sinks. Their cruisers briefly open fire, but concentrated radar-controlled gunfire has really won the day, even though both sides' accuracy is terrible this night. The Japanese eventually head off to the north, having lost two ships and four more damaged. They damage an American cruiser and two destroyers, but that's it at sea. A dawn attack by a hundred or so planes on the ships also fails with the loss of possibly a quarter of the attackers. 
On the second, the Allies expand their beachhead. The Japanese, though, still think this landing is a diversion and expect the main American attack against the local airfields. Harukichi Hayakutaki's 17th Army has 40,000 troops and 20,000 naval personnel on Bougainville. That same day, 75 B-25 bombers with 57 P-38 Lightning fighters as escort hit Rabaul once again though this is half the strength they attacked with last month. This day, they're going after Simpson Harbor. They do sink two merchant ships, damage two cruisers with near misses, and destroy 18 Japanese planes on the ground, but lose 21 total planes of their own. On the 4th, seven cruisers and 173 carrier planes arrive at Rabaul as reinforcements. Merrill's task force is by now too far away at Purvis Bay, and too outnumbered anyhow, to stop such a force. So Bull Halsey's Task Force 38 will have to try. He is taking a huge risk sending out his carriers without major surface escorts, but it has to be done. The other capital ships are away because of impending American attacks in the Central Pacific. Exposing the carriers Saratoga and Princeton to grave danger, Admiral Halsey sends them as close as possible to New Britain so as to be able to launch a big attack on the powerful naval squadron of Admiral Takeo Kurita. Halsey says he expects both carrier plane groups to be cut down and both carriers heavily damaged if not sunk, but there is no other way to protect the beachhead. He also has two anti-aircraft cruisers and nine destroyers. At 11.15 a.m., nearly 100 American planes hit the Japanese base. They are countered by 70 Zeros. They followed the formation, but did not attack, waiting until the U.S. formation split up. Instead, the Navy aircraft held formation until they were over Simpson Harbor. There, every anti-aircraft gun ashore and afloat opened up. It was too late, and the flak was ineffective. The Japanese warships are finishing refueling, and the attackers damage four heavy and two light cruisers and two destroyers. Combined Fleet Commander Minichi Koga thinks that the American carriers are operating with a heavy escort, and he doesn't want to risk his ships further, so he does not order them all out on a seek and destroy mission. In fact, only one of his cruisers, heavy cruiser Suzuya, is undamaged, and it now escorts the rest back to Truk except for one heavy and one light cruiser that are too badly hit. Their entire squadron has been neutralized without firing a shot, and their threat to the Bougainville beachhead is no more. The attackers lose 10 planes, and the Imperial Japanese Navy has pulled its heavy warships from Rabaul. The Japanese do, though, at the other end of their war, launch a new offensive against Changde in northern Hunan province the second, and on the river Taurung, Drive off attacks by the Chinese 38th Division. There's heavy fighting at two ends of the active European fronts as well. In Italy, on October 30th, U.S. 5th Army units take Mondragone, having breached the Barbara Line, the first and weakest enemy defense line. The next day, British 10th Corps makes attacks versus Monte Massico and Monte Santa Croce. These peaks are going to be tough targets. On the 31st, British 8th Army Commander Bernard Montgomery writes, I do not think we can conduct a winter campaign in this country. If I remember, Caesar used to go into winter quarters, a very sound thing to do. But his units advance and on the 2nd take Cantalupo. As for the enemy, on the 1st, Smiling Albert Kesselring issues a director to 10th Army Commander Heinrich von Fietinghoff that he can disregard any danger on the Italian coasts and focus on defending the Bernhard Line, the second line to gain time for fortifying Gustav, the third one evermore. On the second, British troops reach the Garigliano River. On the fourth, British 10th Corps has taken Massico and Santa Croce and will hit Monte Camino next. Other 5th Army units take Venafro and enter Santa Maria Oliveto. Now, there is much more to say about the attacks the last two days of the week and I will backtrack and talk about it all next week. See, Kesselring isn't the only one issuing directives this week. On the third, Adolf Hitler issues Directive 51, that Germany is now in greater danger from the West than the East, so they should not reduce any force in the West and should prioritize sending tanks and artillery there. 
That's interesting because Joseph Goebbels writes in his diary the day before that over 9,000 German soldiers were killed on the Eastern Front in nine days in mid-October. We cannot stand such a drain for long. We are in danger of slowly bleeding to death in the East. It's also interesting because Literally just the last two weeks, Hitler finally agreed to sending all those reinforcements from west to east, as we saw, which managed to stop the Soviet advance late last week. The newly arrived 24th Panzers even reached Lozuvatka, north of Krivoy Rog, the 30th. They also reached Ternuvatka that day, but the Soviet 37th Army has finally fought its way forward and slows their progress. Pavel Rutmistrov's armor which made big advances two weeks ago, now pulls back to defense to have 37th as support. They are soon even taken out of the front lines for refitting and repairs. So Ivan Konyev's breakout to the west is at its end, having failed to reach Krivoy Rog or Kirovograd. It's still a bit of a disappointment for the German side, though, since they very much wanted to destroy Rutmistrov's 5th Guards tank army. The Soviets have held the Lyutej bridgehead for several weeks now, but have been unable to break out of it. Nikolai Vatutin has, though, sent the 3rd Guards tank army up from the Bukharin Bend secretly to reinforce. They've left mocked up tanks behind and radio teams who transmit as if 3rd Guards tank was still there. By November 1st, they are in position, backed by the 1st Guards Cavalry Corps, and with Kirill Moskalenko now in charge of 38th Army, who will lead the coming assault. The Bukharin Bend isn't all that far from Lutej and Kiev, so you may wonder why it took so long. The answer is terrible logistics. The roads parallel to the Dnieper are few and in dire state. Especially with the autumn muds, there aren't many crossings of the Desna River, which is in their path, and they don't have enough fuel in general. Once again, though, like we saw a few months ago, Soviet engineers build bridges submerged just below the river surface to fool Luftwaffe recon. But the Germans are pretty sure the enemy is going to strike somewhere near Kiev, and they've been bringing up the reinforcements. Both sides, then, have a real opportunity. For the Soviets, well, it's obviously liberating the third largest city in the Soviet Union, which would create a big gap between army groups center and south. But for the Germans, all those fresh units that came in from the west could allow them to really counterattack in strength and, and wreck the Soviet armor enough for there to be a pause for the German units to rest and refit. In the Lutej bridgehead, Moskalenko's new command prepared to launch the attack that Stavka hoped would herald the final collapse of the German lines. Moskalenko had four rifle corps and fifth guards tank corps at his disposal, together with the independent 1st Czechoslovak Infantry Brigade. The intention was to break out of the bridgehead towards the south with the Sviatoshino district at the western edge of Kiev, the main objective. This would require an advance of perhaps 10 miles and would render impossible any continued German presence in Kiev. There will also be thrusts to Fastov and Bilatserkva, and to protect against the enemy hitting the Soviet bridgehead from behind, 60th Army is heading down to guard the flanks. Moskalenko plans to attack on a front of just under 6 kilometers, meaning he'll have 380 artillery pieces per kilometer. The hope is to celebrate October Revolution Day, the 7th, in Kiev. On the morning of the 3rd, the artillery barrage begins, and it is one mother of a barrage. When the Soviets advance, they meet heavy resistance as local defense reserves are committed, but the Germans are still compelled to withdraw. They just do not have the numbers or firepower to stop the Soviets. On the 4th, after another barrage, the attack begins again. By the end of the day, Pavel Rybalko's 3rd Guards Tank Army spearheads have reached the northwest and even the western suburbs of Kiev. But a real breakthrough eludes them. To be fair, the terrain favors defense and low clouds limit what air support they can get, but still, they gotta try something else. Towards the end of the day, Rybalko received orders from Vatutin to go forward and to coordinate matters. He met his corps commanders and issued instructions for an evening attack. After a further artillery bombardment, all available vehicles were to advance, and in an attempt to overawe the German defenses, Rebalco ordered that the vehicles should have all available lights blazing and horns and sirens blaring. 
the attack was a success. The German defensive lines were finally overcome. The Soviet tanks reach and take Sviatoshino, immediately west of Kiev, cutting the road to Zhitomir. It seems like there is no way the Germans can now hold Kiev. And as the week ends, the local garrison begins evacuation. But that's not all. Today, the 5th, the Soviets overrun the area between the Lower Dnieper and the Crimea. German 6th Army pulls back across the river, leaving only the bridgehead at Nikopol on the east bank. The Soviets are exhausted by this point, though, and the defense, the terrain, and the weather all conspire to now stop them. But they've accomplished a lot. I mean, they fought all the way here from the Mius River in not that many weeks. That's nearly 500 kilometers. And they really cut off contact with Crimea piece by piece. The 30th, they reach Genichesk. The 31st, they take Chaplinka, which cuts the rail lines. And the 1st, take Perikop and Armiansk, isolating Crimea. And that, too, is not all. Last month, between October 6th and 10th, right? The Soviets liberated Neville and drove a salient into the German lines at the juncture of army groups north and center. Well, now on the 2nd, Soviet 3rd and 4th shock armies expand on that, breaking a 16-kilometer gap in the left flank of German 3rd Panzer Army southwest of Neville. 3rd then turns north and behind 16th Army flanks, and 4th heads behind 3rd Panzer armies. Hitler recognizes the danger here, and on the 4th, orders counterattacks to close the gap to go off next week on the 8th. And that is this week of the war. With important gains by the Soviets, and Kiev in their sights, gains by the Allies in Italy, and the successful beginning to a big Allied campaign in the South Seas, with some real damage done to Japanese air and sea power. And, of course, Hitler issues Directive 51, which reads in part... For the last two and one half years, the bitter and costly struggle against Bolshevism has made the utmost demands upon the bulk of our resources and energies. The situation has since changed. The threat from the East remains, but an even greater danger looms in the West, the Anglo-American landing. In the East, the vastness of space will, as a last resort, permit a loss of territory even on a major scale without suffering a mortal blow to Germany's chance for survival. Not so in the West. All signs point to an offensive against the Western Front of Europe no later than spring and perhaps earlier. For that reason, I can no longer justify the weakening of the West in favor of other theaters of war. I have therefore decided to strengthen the defenses in the West, the entire striking force of our enemy, will of course be directed against our forces manning the coast. Only an all-out effort in the construction of fortifications, an unsurpassed effort that will enlist all available manpower and physical resources of Germany and the occupied areas, will be able to strengthen our defenses along the coast within the short time that still appears to be left to us. The directive goes on to order stationary weapons heavily concentrated and dug in, and specific orders to the Army, the Navy, the Luftwaffe, and the SS as to what forces they can and will release for anti-Allied service in the West. All of the commanders of a whole bunch of departments or branches of service are to report to Hitler already by November 15th what measures have been taken. There is a link below to the full text of the directive. It is ambitious, make no mistake, to build an impregnable Atlantic wall. Billions of Reichsmarks and hundreds of thousands, e even millions of laborers, to build thousands of bunkers from southern France to northern Norway to concentrate steel and concrete from the Bay of Biscay to Denmark and to man Western Europe with a mighty, unbeatable armored reserve. If this is possible, and if this can be done before the Allies attack, well, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, if. Who knows what the future holds, right? But I will be here to cover it thanks to you in the Time Ghost Army. You finance this coverage. Daniel Hay is the Time Ghost Army Member of the Week, and these are the newest commissioned officers. You too can join the Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. It's a good thing. It makes this series possible. And hey, check out this special that we did that covers the planning for Barbarossa, the beginning of the invasion of the Soviet Union. Right here. It's pretty cool. See you next time. <laughs>